right, let's use this time to get some of you guys' questions out because I've done most of the talking for the last two and a half days. So after all this, so far, where are you at? What's up? What's your question? Jordan? Yeah, Mark. <laughs> Keep your hands raised. You see, when, when there's an imbalance in love, you are too impatient, so you're performing well, you go fast, you go fast. <laughs> But then there's just, you miss a little bit of wisdom and then you end up having to course correct. <laughs> That's wisdom. <laughs> so my question is, uh, thank you, first of all. Are all maps and stories, including the law of one map and story, mere paltry shadows or children's toys in comparison to the naked, immediate omnipresence of absolute infinity? Yes. For sure. Good question. Yes, all this is redundant. <laughs> but it's better than what you get in school. <laughs> <laughs> but it's super valuable to quote unquote get there, get the realizations and so forth. But when you're at the destination, the map is utterly useless. Except to tell other people where to go, you know, drop a pin. So that's what we're doing, dropping pins. And then it's helpful, I found it helpful as a pin dropper <laughs> to, to have the knowledge that I have and the maps that I do have, because it does help me to drop pins for others. And it has occasionally helped me to sort of find my own way back, if that makes sense. So, so I absolutely honor the maps that I honor, like, and I have the deepest respect for them. But as to your question, literally, Yes, <laughs> it uh, pales in comparison to that and is not needed at some point. Did you have a question? Yeah. That was balanced, Mark. Nice. <laughs> Still fast, loving, passionate, but also deliberate, focused, using the context of past experience to decide. Very good. I get I get your teaching about um, following the bread the breadcrumbs of excitement mm -hmm. appealing. Um, Sorry, appealing to me. Appealing, okay. Yes, because um, I used to build this um, belief system about sacrifice and martyrdom and um, letting go of my personal preferences for the sake of. Uh, for the sake of service to others. Mm -hmm. So I thought. Mm -hmm. So um, I used to be in this spiritual path where I was kind of, that was a good thing to do, letting go of my personal preferences. And, but it felt like some sort of martyrdom. It had that feeling, to me at, at least. Yeah. So um, my question is. Great. Yes. Great question. Shall I? Oh, go ahead. <laughs> My question is, you talked about sacrifice, and I get that. Like, well, I think I'm familiar with what, yeah, you, what I got, you explained. But I got, also, I, I need clarification on the following the breadcrumbs of excitement versus yes. sacrifice. Yes, nice. Great question. So the idea of following the breadcrumb trails of excitement is very briefly based on the methodology um, 
to some degree inspired by Bashar. I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with that teacher. And so the formula that they give, they, because they're an ET species, the formula they give is this is their question to every, sorry, this is their answer to every other question. <laughs> His. Act on your excitement. You could say highest. We often say highest. Act on your highest excitement to the best of your ability until you can take it no further with zero expectation as to what the outcome ought to be. And I'm a big fan of that methodology. I think it works great. The reasoning behind it is that they say excitement is the body's way of indicating. It's the, it's the vibration in the body's translation of your true self. So when something is presented to you and it excites you, doesn't mean it can't also intimidate you or bring up some fears. It often does. So you have to be a little rigorous to tell the difference. Like, okay, is there excitement here? And if so, what of it is excitement? What about it is anxiety, perhaps? What of it is fear? But in essence, when something excites you, when a breadcrumb trail, an opportunity, a choice, an option, a meeting, a party, uh, an activity, reading a book by yourself, that, 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 in each moment, Choose whatever option out of the options that you can perceive that generates the most excitement in you when you ponder that option, when you feel into that option. And that's your body's way of letting you know that that's the fastest way to everything that's good for you. However, People often trip up because as they start saying yes to that, they develop expectations as to what the outcome should be. They de develop images, goals, and they think it's the goal that excites them. So in the process of that, you get better and better at distilling what about it excites you exactly. And or it doesn't even so much matter if you trust this formula and you actually act on your highest excitement to the best of your ability 
until you can take it no further with absolutely zero expectation as to what the outcome should be, then that is following the breadcrumb trail of your highest excitement. And I've depicted it as a breadcrumb trail because it's something comes to your awareness, you choose, you follow it until you can't, and you pause and you look for the next breadcrumb. And it's not often that the breadcrumb trail of your excitement is linear. But if you project an image onto it, and you think, and at some point things start going wrong and sour, and you're like, what happened? I followed my excitement. Well, actually, you started acting on what you thought the outcome ought to be. Somehow, somewhere along the lines, along the road of following your highest excitement, you got lost in the image of what you thought it should be, which is linear. Whereas if you actually pause, stand up, check in in your field of experience, see what stands out the most now. Where's the next breadcrumb trail? What does it indicate? What indicates highest excitement for me? And then you fully trust that and you go there and you take action on that exciting activity until you can take it no further. And you have zero expectation as to what the outcome should be then you'll notice it, it sort of exhausts itself. <sighs> There's a pause moment, you get back up, sort of like eyes off the road, where's the next breadcrumb trail? You scan your experiential environment, so to speak, your the options, opportunities, what makes sense to you, and whatever excites you the most, you go act on that. Eyes on the road, follow it until you can take it no further, no expectation. <sighs> It exhausts itself, you pause, eyes off the road, what's the next opportunity? What are the next choices for me? So if you continue to follow that excitement, it's actually following the translation mechanism of higher self's guidance. It's the physical body's interpretation of the higher self's guidance is excitement, according to this methodology, or according to Bashar. Uh, so I've tried that out and it works. And after a while that becomes a natural part of your intuitive ability as to how you navigate. But at first it's method methodological method methodolo method methodological? Is that a thing? Yeah, but like the approach is methodological. <laughs> Methodical, that's it. <laughs> Thank you. So so you agree with that formula? That's kind of what you're talking about? Yes. Actually okay. Um, me being here in this retreat is due to that. So Exactly, and, you know, right? Yeah, yeah. So who here got excited about this event and it stood out above anything else and you just felt like that be the greatest excitement? And you had some hesitations, probably, some fear, some intimidation, some concerns, some logistics, da 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 da, da. Um, And some people thought they were going to come, followed their excitement, and maybe it there's one woman that said, actually, I'm not coming, but it's in my highest excitement not to come. Um, with absolutely no hard feelings, just like, oop, I got deviated. So it's a good example of not holding on to the image that you have. Because often in this nonlinear path of following your excitement, you get excited about the goal that you can perceive. You're given a symbol from your higher mind so that you have something to reference as a choice that you can take action on. That symbol, if you tune into it, if it's the one that's the most accelerated path for you, you will feel excitement about that symbol. Let's say, just a very simple example, let's say uh, buying a new car. So you wanna buy a Ferrari and you have suddenly you have the opportunity and the image, the symbol is buying that Ferrari that you always wanted as a kid or something like that, your dream, your dream car. So that's the image that comes to mind. And it excites you when you tune into it. Now, most people, again, think that what excites them is the Ferrari. But it's not. That's not why they're excited. That's just a, that's just a symbol to be able to tune your attention to a particular direction within this vibrational ocean of the illusion that has been generated by your mind-body-spirit complex so that you can sift through things and crystallize yourself and carve yourself out of this energy field that you are. Crystallize yourself. 
specify, make yourself precise, subtler, a specific, unique, cut gemstone that radiates and reflects the light of the Creator in His brilliant, unique way, instead of a milky kind of uncut stone that, even though it's a diamond, it could easily be mistaken for rose quartz or words, right? So you want to carve yourself out on a relative path, you want to carve yourself out and following the guidance of it, what excites you is a very crucial component of that. Learning to listen to what resonates, what truly excites you. To commit to that, not get swayed by the image. So for example, maybe you're just meet, meant to meet the car dealer, but you're not going to wake up, suddenly have the idea to go meet a car dealer and like go on a date with them or something. Maybe it's your future wife is the car dealer at Ferrari. But you don't have that symbol. Your higher mind has that symbol. Your higher mind knows of all the probabilities and timelines and so forth. But the way to let your conscious mind, which can only focus on the physical present moment, know which direction to go, it uses resonance excitement. So that when you think of going to the car dealer, or sorry, when you think of, yeah, going to get that car, that's what excites you. Now, if you're fixated on the image of the car, you might miss out on your meant-to-be wife. Whereas if you stay true to what excites you, maybe there's a bump in the road and you're like, no, but I have to get to the thing. Well, actually, you're just meant to meet the person at the door and take her out on a date, and the Ferrari was never actually part of your dream. This silly example just came to mind, but you get the point. The image is there to tune you to a certain direction, but then you got to be non-attached to the result of that direction and just trust in that path until the next most exciting thing guides you. But if you fixate it on an image along the way, you're going to shoot past that next cue, that next breadcrumb trail, because going from breadcrumb trail A or 1, well, you get it. So imagine a point, then the next point. Now you're going to formulate in your linear mind that the third point is going to be in a straight line. You know, first point, second point, you're like, oh, well, this is the direction. But with the guidance from the higher self, often how it goes is do, 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 five steps back, up, down, do, 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 and you have no sense of what it is to become. You have no sense of why it's going all over the board sometimes, very non-linearly, very non-logically, seemingly. Until you keep following it, keep following it, keep following it, keep following it. And suddenly, when all the lines between those dots are connected or enough, you start to see a pattern. You start to see logic, nonlinear logic. The higher mind's logic behind all the important points in your life that excited you, that you trusted in. If you don't trust in this excitement, you're just going to fuck up your life. Quite literally, that's what you do. You're just going to fuck up your life because you think you know better than your higher mind knows. Because you're not trusting the impulse of excitement of what lights you up. You're not trusting in that. You think in terms of images, calculations, da 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 da. So you're in charge of either fucking up your life or trusting in your resonance, in the intelligence that lets you know through excitement where the next direction is, what the next focus is, what the next step is, not where you're headed. That's just to tune your mind, to have some symbol, to ask yourself, does that symbol excite me? If it's yes, you might only be meant to take 10% of the step towards that goal, and then you get redirected. If you're fixated, you'll call it an obstacle. But if you trust and you listen, it'll navigate you to what's the next most perfect thing. And usually all the things you truly want will somehow follow in your wake. They'll just be there to support you and empower you without you having to fixate on it as an object. It'll be behind you, pushing you forward in the true direction of your life. So suddenly you'll have a Ferrari and it, it took no effort, but you're driving it to your next bullet point. You're driving it to your next breadcrumb trail because you trust it. Now the Ferrari is no longer an object in your mind. It's just a circumstantial support system that follows in your wake effortlessly. But if you get fixated on it, you have the Ferrari, and then what? Static image, you didn't meet your wife, you're not supported, your finances drop, you have to sell the car, lose a bunch of money, and you're like, fuck, God, why did that excite me? Why did you, I trusted my excitement. No, initially, yes, but then you got fixated. 
you had an image in your mind. You didn't trust in a nonlinear moment to moment breadcrumb trail. Follow your excitement to the best of your ability until you can do so no further with absolutely zero expectation as to what the outcome ought to be. But if you follow that formula consistently moment to moment as if you are looking down at the road, focus on the road, pause, look up from the road, identify the next breadcrumb of excitement, and you can visualize the options in your life at any given moment as the fingers of your hand, like this, where you have one neutral option that is in line with your current vibrational domain. Meaning that if you take that option, it doesn't really excite you or not excite you. It's just kind of neutral, comfortable, safe. And that's usually what people take. That's why they flatline. Or that's why they just kind of coast and plateau. And why most people's lives, if you look at the people from your high school, um, a lot of them kind of live the same life. It's predictable. You kind of already knew what they were going to end up doing, being, exploring, da, da, da. They're still talking about the same things. Is because they choose the safe, calculable, comfortable road. And if they're smart, they don't go much lower than that. And so they end up decent, just like, oh, okay, I lived my life. <laughs> so the option below, the, the option below that is one that's that scares, not scares you, because the excitement can scare you too. Let's see. The more depressing option that's more steeped in concern, more fear-based, more limitation-based, more lack-based, and it just kind of feels like, oh, I kind of don't want to do that, but it's okay. Or maybe I perceive that I have to. Or I don't believe much more is possible, and it just, I just have to do this. I just have to get through this. Okay, fine. And then the last one is, or the lowest one, of the five fingers on the hand would be something that's just severely depressing, limiting, etc. So for any more choice point, you have these five options. Uh, the one above the main one is one that kind of elevates you. It's kind of exciting. It's like, oh, hey, you want to go see a movie tonight? Yeah, let's go see a movie tonight. Cool. I hadn't thought of that. Exciting. And this one is, let's ignite global awakening. <laughs> And you're like, oh, shit, that sounds amazing. But... But this and that. Or you just have faith. Like if you don't project past the current breadcrumb trail of what excites you, which is just a friend telling you, hey, I heard about this concept of igniting global awakening and we're all part of this metaphysical already existent team that doesn't belong to any particular organization and you can plug into that and be lit up and be of service right away just by understanding this one principle. Are you down? In that moment, that excites that person, maybe. Let's say it does. And you're like, oh, fuck, yes. If they don't project past that breadcrumb trail, that's all they got to do. It's just the next activity to do is to say yes to that, to feel it until you can take that no further, with no expectation of where it's supposed to go. And then and that will show you the next step. The steps appear as you're taking them. They are not laid out for the physical brain. The higher mind has all these different trajectories depending on how you vibrationally constitute yourself towards the choices in your life. If you are able to consistently trust in the highest excitement options, even if your doubts about it kick in, but you're able to reframe that so that your anxiety turns into excitement and alignment with that possibility and you're not dependent on outcome. You can lift freely like a free adventurer, moment to moment, in faith of the creator of your well-being. This is why self-realization is also empowering because if you realize the indestructible infinite nature of yourself directly in direct experience that it's already here, already the case, then it's much easier to consistently choose the highest vibrational option because you know you're safe. And if you don't choose that, then the next bullet point or breadcrumb will start at that level of reality. Now you can coast here for a bit, or you can just do next breadcrumb, next breadcrumb. But if you choose this one, the five breadcrumbs will spring from that. Now your new baseline, which was a little lower than before, is now the central option. If you choose the lowest, now the highest is back to your baseline. It's not higher than where you were. Does that make sense? 
So use the visualization of your hand at any given moment. Just look at your hand. Say, am I ready for this? Am I down for this one? Or am I going to play it small? Am I going to play into fears? Now, I'm not saying you shouldn't honor your fears if they're really stubborn. Uh, who here has not heard about the three-day process? Oh, cool. Oh, oh. Who here, raise your hand again, if you have not heard me talk about the three-step process or the three-day process. Okay, cool. Very brief. The first day, on day one, you have this new exciting idea. Let's say your friend just sold you on being metaphysically, just by intention, part of this collective and service to others, the ignition of global awakening. And it lights you up and you say, yes, mm. it's a new intention. It sets a new intention for your life. Or tomorrow we'll be doing some of the calling work, some of the mission work, some of the teamwork aspects. I say we because, again, Richard will be up here with me. And so it excites you. That's day one is you have a new intention or a new revelation or a new insight or maybe you healed some trauma and you can see clearly again and you're like, fuck yes, this is what I'm meant to be. This is what resonates. This is what excites me. I'm lit up. That's day one. It's the day of the new realization, the new intention, the new vision. Then comes day two, which can be a year later or it can be two seconds later. Often it is two seconds later and begins. <laughs> or the following days, it starts. So day two is the day of the challenge. It's the safety trigger. You thought you were ready to fire the gun, but it's asking you, are you sure you want to pull the trigger on this? This is a safety mechanism, day two, is if you're not constituted as your new vision or intention, then you better not pull the trigger because you won't be able to thrive in that reality. So day number two is filled with challenge. Your mom will call you. She'll need, she'll need your help out of nowhere. And then your friend suddenly starts arguing with wife and doing this all your life. And everything seems to oppose you. Suddenly the money that you needed to do that thing won't come through. Day two. It happens every single fucking time. <laughs> There's exceptions, which I'll get into in a bit. What most people do is they go back to day zero. Day zero is the day before the new vibration kicked in. And this is how we have structured our society. This is how we typically educate our kids, for the most part. Not you guys, of course, but most conventional people, they teach kids about concern and fear and small-mindedness. So as day two challenge arise, they don't recognize it as an opportunity to step up. They recognize it as solid proof from the universe that I'm delusional in what I want. That I was naive. I don't deserve to dream that big. What was I thinking? Never mind. I'll go back to my job. It's a challenge. It's an invitation. You had the vision. You had the target. You got excited. You were all aimed already. You pulled the trigger. And something paused you. Gives you that final choice to decide if you're ready to pull the trigger on your new life a new direction, that new frequency, that new intention. And if you stay true throughout the day two challenge, which doesn't mean be stubborn or insistent upon the image or the goal, it means stay true, stay in confidence, in conviction, don't harden yourself. That could work sometimes, but don't harden yourself. Just Smile it off with confidence. All things shall work out. This is a test. This is a challenge. This is an invitation. And my answer is yes, I'm ready. Just approach it that way and approach the challenges that way and always believe in the possibility that anything can be circumnavigated with integrity, with passion, with belief in the possibility. Then when you stay true, you surpass or pass day two, the day two challenge, and you enter into day three, which is the day of confirmation that indeed your vision is possible, celebration and transformation. And you can't go back from that point 
especially if it's a more profound kind of choice moment in your life, it'll boost your confidence for the rest of your life. You can draw upon that memory base, upon that conviction for the rest of your life. If you keep building that, building that, building that, if you keep applying that, it becomes really challenging to understand. You can out of compassion, but in then in contrast to someone who lives conventionally, it feels like a zombie. It feels like they've accepted zombie mode and they and it's sad to see that they have no belief in themselves and what's possible and they haven't had that confirmation. And it's not your right to step in and try to alter that or teach them, but part of you would love to just show them what they're not seeing is possible, how they could live. Right? So breadcrumb trail of excitement, no expectation as to the outcome, consistently trust and have faith, choose the highest of the five options as often as you can, Honor your belief systems when they come up and when they trigger you, but do the work to dissolve those lack beliefs, reason with them, investigate them, dissolve them until they seem nonsensical to you, and stay true to your vision. Be determined, not stubborn, but determined, confident. When you're confident, things will move out of your way. When you're insistent, you kind of get stuck with the obstacles in your path. Keep flowing, smile it off with confidence and skillfulness. Address whatever needs to be addressed to maintain your integrity. Communicate whatever changes need to be communicated. But stay true to your true north, to that new level vision that excited you without attachment to the image, but trusting in the vibration that that image represented so you can navigate left or right whenever you need to, as soon as you need to, as soon as the next breadcrumb presents itself to you. How does that operate or gel with sacrifice? Right? That's your question. Yes. Well, first of all, this also requires sacrifice. Following your highest excitement absolutely requires sacrifice. You have to sacrifice your beliefs. If you want to take this next level option, it's a reason why it's not your baseline yet. So it's your baseline. <laughs> <laughs> so appreciate your baseline, but also, fuck it. <laughs> and then, this is not your baseline yet because your belief system doesn't fully support it yet. Otherwise, it'd be your baseline. What you currently have is your baseline, which simply means if I just chill and I don't do anything abnormal for the next month, my life is going to be kind of like it is. That's your baseline. You're coasting, which is fine. There's absolutely nothing wrong with this. <laughs> so if you choose a higher option, you're going to have to sacrifice your belief systems some way some way, shape, or form, they're going to trans either transform or they're going to dissolve or you kind of have to just say fuck it to them. So there's a sacrifice. There's a Every time you choose a much higher reality than you're used to or even a significantly or somewhat higher reality vibrationally, you have to become constituted at a higher frequency of consciousness, which is another way of saying a higher density of consciousness. It's a different angle or approach, but it's essentially the same statement. It's the indirect approach to increasing the density of your consciousness. It's through following your excitement and transforming your belief systems so that you can, from your state of being, support yourself with conviction at a vibration that will attract and reflect much different scenarios, people, relationships, conversations, t -t 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 grace, abundance, and so forth. Everything comes easier. Everything flows faster. So you have to sacrifice your comfort with certain things. Right? What, you're, what you're used to is comfortable. It's, you're not used to that new level of consciousness. So every time you step it up, you have to pass through some kind of eye of the needle. Some are smaller, others are more lenient or forgiving. 
But with the smallest ones, if even a single microfiber is sticking out, boing, 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 it'll not go through. Oh, that went through. Sorry. It will not go through the eye of the needle. <laughs> even a little fiber sticking out. Sacrifice means to become so streamlined and so single minded and so intentional and so in integrity with that intention that there is no question that anything can distract you. Not yourself, not your own temptations from the past, not highly organized fifth density service to self beings. There's no question because you're constituted with absolute faith in that. So you have to sacrifice everything you're tempted to think about, fear about, be concerned about. If your conviction and your faith is strong enough, That means you literally are pulling a thick layer of snakeskin off of yourself to be left behind forever. That's sacrifice. You're not going to be the same consciousness, the same person. You're not going to have the same past and future as you did before you passed through the eye of that needle. It requires sacrifice to follow your highest excitement to the best of your ability every moment that you can till you can't do it any further with absolutely zero expectation as to what the outcome ought to be. It, that is sacrifice. Sacrifice is really another way of saying be super intentional and stay consistent and in integrity with that intention or with that intentionality in general. It's another word for single-mindedness, single-pointedness. Single-pointedness means a sacrifice of all your temptations and distractions that are not part of that frequency. So every time you choose deliberately, intentionally, and with power and faith, especially if it matters and makes a difference for others, then the integrity becomes crucial and you'll be tested in that integrity. And that's the sacrifice. You have to leave behind a lot of the comfortable things and the personal tendencies that you have. It just depends on how, and fast is not always better, but it depends on how fast you up-level. The faster you up-level, the more obvious it will be that it requires sacrifice. It requires consistent effort, consistent discomfort, consistent self-reflection, consistently not feeling like you know who you are. And moving through it, moving through it, moving through it, having faith, having faith, deepening your faith. If you follow your highest excitement consistently, you will become more one-pointed, you will be making sacrifices naturally, and you will be training for this automatically. And yes, your highest excitement is naturally plugged into the highest excitement and best interest of everyone. I don't know if that answers your question, does it? Totally. Okay. Yeah. Pre <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. It's yeah. totally clear now. Mm. Yeah. See, following your highest excitement and playing the game of sacrifice is often the same thing. That's why people don't. If it took no sacrifice to follow your highest excitement, people would be following their highest excitement all the time. Why don't they? Because it requires sacrifice. Even being self-honest is a sacrifice to the ego. Why? Because it generates discomfort. Who likes discomfort? Not many, right? And that's only because of your training. Only because now you know when something is uncomfortable, it holds a juicy fucking gem just waiting to be carved out of the rug. So you're already excited for it. Ooh, discomfort. Ooh, I feel some awkwardness arising, some social tension. Hmm, I know this is going to lead to something fantastic. This is going to cut new ground. This is going to step it up. I know already by the end of this evening, everyone's going to feel the fuck on fire. So I'm excited when there is discomfort in a room. 
or in myself. Because I know it indicates next level. Are you ready for that? Yes or no? That's what these opportunities ask you. But initially, nobody likes discomfort. It's a sacrifice to choose a route that is uncomfortable, that requires you to consistently inspect yourself. Where am I coming from with this word? Where am I coming from with that thought? Where am I coming from with this activity? And then to not justify it. Also not, also not to judge yourself. You should be confident that your intention ultimately is a good one. You should feel good about the fact that you have a good heart. You shouldn't doubt yourself like that. But you should not justify where your actions are coming from when you know it's full of shit. Just acknowledge where they're coming from. That's all. But it's a sacrifice. In order to build truer self-esteem, you need to sacrifice your self-image over and over again. In order to build true self-esteem, you need to sacrifice your self-image over and over again. That's what built self-esteem. Call it character, if you will. Call it courage. Call it faith. Call it empowerment. Even awakening can fit in that category to some degree. Service to others absolutely requires you to sacrifice your self-image over and over again. And I say it's worth it. But that's just my opinion, based on my experience. Any more questions? Oh. You also talk about desire and how desire was needed. And I would like if you can extend on that topic, please. How desire was needed? Yeah. You talk about desire. Yes. How it's the remover of obstacles? Um, yes. Okay. Well, it's simple. <clears throat> Who here identifies or has identified in the past? as a shy person. So it's not the most comfortable thing in the world for you to ask someone on the street for directions. Raise your hand. If that's not something that you'd like to do, yeah, there's a little bit of a barrier there, or used to be. Okay. So <clears throat> your self-image is, I'm a shy person. That's what you've been telling yourself. And you have, you'd rather spend sort of half an hour trying to find it, going back and forth between different roundabouts, then ask a person on the street that solves it right away. Right? You know these experiences? Where you're like, yeah, yeah. No, I'm okay. I got I still got some time. I'll figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> and it's okay. I'm just introvert. I'm just a shy person. That's a static image. That's a self image. That's not self esteem. That's not character. I'm just tying these two together. I'm answering your question, but now, <clears throat> your child's in the back seat and they need to be rushed to the hospital ASAP. Otherwise, he'll die. Are you a shy person? You don't know the directions to the hospital. Are you a shy person? You might even be shouting at the person. Imagine doing that with no good reason, right? You just want, hey, can you tell me the directions to the hospital? <laughs> that wouldn't cross your mind to ever do that, especially as a shy person. But that's what you're doing because you have a desire. Suddenly, none of your self-images pose any obstacle whatsoever to get the job done, to be who you need to be. Because there is incentive, there is desire. This is just a very simple example as to how a lack of intensity or purity of desire is kind of the same thing. The purer the desire, the more powerful it is. The stronger the desire, the purer it is. So the purer the desire, the stronger the desire, the less you will place obstacles in your road, in your own way. 
And you can find this with anything. Take something that you kind of want, but you also don't want it because it generates discomfort. You got to have this phone call with this person. Da, 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 da. Let's say your phone bill thing, something is messed up and they took out an additional $30. It's not the end of the world for you, but you also don't like the feeling of it. You'd like to have your money back. But it's like, mm, you know, I have to be on the phone with Horizon. Is it worth my time? I don't know. Is it, uh, uh. But if somehow they plundered your entire bank account, <laughs> let's say they have $300,000. This is a general example. Then are you going to call? Is it worth your time? Are there obstacles? Do you suddenly not... Are you suddenly thinking about not calling Verizon? No. So the stronger the desire, the less the obstacles appear. Because you don't create them. You create the vast majority of your obstacles. That goes for self-realization as well as for actualization, empowerment, and service to others. You produce most of your obstacles. vast majority of them. As soon as you intensify your desire, proportionate to how intense and pure your desire is, exactly to that does the amount of obstacles disappear. They are not overcome. They disappear. It's like suddenly all the clouds in the sky you're trying to navigate, it's a clear blue sky. And you're like, huh? Well, whatever. I don't know where that concern went, but it's not here. They disappear because you stop conjuring them up. The end of any obstacle, most any obstacle, the end of most obstacles is when you stop conjuring up the obstacle. It's not about overcoming. It's about not creating it not being convinced of it, not believing in it, not projecting it, not thinking it. And the intensity of desire will reveal to you that the vast majority of your obstacles are completely imagined and self-generated. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Okay. Any other questions about anything that I've shared in this retreat so far? One of the best ways to make a shift permanent, any shift, the shift, is by understanding, seeing the value of making that shift permanent to such a degree that your desire for it is absolute. So that suddenly there are no obstacles and suddenly you have shifted without even shifting. Because you just permanently stop conjuring up the obstacles or the distance between you and your goal or your intention. So the shift really is desiring it enough to no longer conjure up the distance or obstacles between where you are and where you think you wish to be. And if you prioritize that enough, which you can only, you cannot just do that out of character. You got to do that out of insight. You got to see the real value of the shift, how it's going to affect every part of your life and how you want that with every fiber of your soul. Once you see that, you can't unsee it, you have made the shift permanent. It's a permanent shift. Doesn't mean you're not learning past that point. Doesn't mean you're not expanding past that point. Doesn't mean you're not intensifying the density of your awareness past that point. You are. But you've made some crucial shift that each of you can define at their own level. But your alignment to your life, your choice to align to your calling and be an embodiment of that consistently is now a permanent choice. It has shifted into a permanent, not even choice. You know it's permanent when it's no longer a choice. Right? You know the shift is permanent when it's no longer a choice. What is currently in your life that's obvious to you, that's no longer a choice, and why is it no longer a choice? Because it's the only reasonable thing to do. So it's not a choice. 
So make living your calling or whatever the shift is for you, resting in the I am, make your shift permanent by realizing that it's the only sensible thing to do so that there is no choice about it. That's how the shift is known to be permanent. That is no longer a choice. Thank you for fielding my question. Um, uh, it was my experience and I think a common experience that we struggle to find balance in our daily life of practice. And we talked about the inevitable balance between wisdom and love. Um, and an imbalance would look like maybe listening to a ton of lectures, reading a ton, a ton of self-inquiry, and then burning out and maybe vegging out on Netflix or video games for a few days and struggling uh, intuitively to find that balance. Um, and Monday, you know, we'll all be out of here and all of this sounds great and we want to be more devoted. Can you give us any insights on how we can be better self-paced and find a better healthy balance in our daily practice? Cool, good question. Well, I wish there was a shortcut for this, but I don't think in most cases there is. So it is a matter of experience, getting to know yourself, accepting yourself, understanding where you go off course, the nuances of that, when something is out of balance, noticing it sooner, earlier on, and so forth. But the essential requirement is that your, your fundamental prioritization has shifted, what you value what you deem as important, what has now become a no-brainer. Again, you know the shift is permanent when being it and living it is a no-brainer. Then there's going to still be components just by virtue of having a physical body and a mind that has limited resources, so to speak, physical mind anyway, that has limited resources. There's going to be things that you need to learn how to balance and you need to notice where am I coming from in this tendency that tends to burn me out and then I collapse or I get sick or I do this or I do that to counteract that. And if you can catch those tendencies, those imbalances in their earlier stages, quicker and quicker, subtler and subtler, you can re-steer them, you can balance them out by already imagining where it's going to lead based on past experience if you continue to follow that temptation, temptation tendency or weakness. You already know, like, mm, and it's gonna, do, and I'm gonna go to, well, and I lose three months of feeling balanced. So, no, I'm not even gonna look in that direction. I notice it. Oh, no, nip it in the butt. At some level, that's what it takes to up your balance. It's like, nope, no, I just know. Have this no nonsense policy field towards yourself. Towards yourself. Another fun way to say this, which we'll address tomorrow probably a little bit too, is distinguish yourself from your psychology. Richard gave me this, this insight, this distinction uh, when we were working with our team. is like so much of teamwork goes down the drain. It's not high performance, it's not effective, it's not efficient, it's not aligned because we're counting on each other's psychology instead of on each other's word or decision or declaration. So you have to develop the ability to declare something to yourself, which develops a no-nonsense policy field vibrationally, if it's true, so that when a tendency arises that is rooted in psychology, you are no longer that. You are what you determine, declare, and say. So you creating a distinction between your psychology, your shit, your stuff, your trauma, your conditioning, and you determine 
that what I am is what I say I am, and this is what I'm going to be. Period. I'm going to stay true to my declaration, true to my word, and in the process of doing so, I'm defining myself, I'm carving myself out of my own mess. Because I'm saying I'm not this bullshit. Oh, I'm not in the mood, I don't feel this. No, once you've made a declaration of promise, you're distinguishing yourself from your psychology. You're, you're no longer just assuming that you are your mood swings, that you are your imbalances, that you are your needs, your lack of beliefs, your tendencies, your desires, your cravings. You are what you say you are. You are your word, you are your declaration, you are your determination, you are your decision. You are free will. Another way of saying this is how many of there are you? How many of you are there? Sorry. How many? How many of there are you? <laughs> how many of you are there in you? Anyone? <laughs> One step too far, my friend. <laughs> how many of there of you are there? One. So who's calling the shots? Who decides who you are? How many of you are there? What? So who's calling the shots? Yeah. Who is this other guy or girl that you keep giving into? There isn't any, it's a choice. By making that choice and identifying as that choice, you're accelerating and carving yourself out of the muck of the human collective weakness. You're transcending the human collective. You're transmuting it into something powerful and potent like this carved out, beautifully polished diamond. So anytime you're like, oh yeah, that sounds great, but who? Is there two of you? One who thinks that's great and the other who thinks it's not? Or who feels differently? How many of you are there? Go to the I am and check how many I am's there are. Do you count three or four? <laughs> Is there a childhood I am? Is there a future I am? How many I am's in your direct experience are there to make a decision? So who's calling the shots? So stop blaming your psychology as if there's this tiny little dude living inside your brain that's in addition to yourself. That's what it means to distinguish yourself from your psychology and to be constituted as your word, as your determination, as your free will. Does that make sense? And this is empowering when you get this, that you don't have to be at the whim. Just because everyone else, of your own psychology, just because everyone else validates that behavior, doesn't mean it makes any sense. Right? And it's powerful because you're back in control of your life. You're taking ownership of your free will. You stop believing that there's this shadow character or this ego or this conditioning that makes choices for you. It's just not the case. It's a shadow idea. It's a phantom. And this takes some action. This takes some process to get the experiential confirmation of the power of this. That I am what I say I am, not how I feel today. Not what I think based on my childhood belief system. If I say I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this. Every time I act on what I say I'm going to do instead of how I feel that day, especially if you align that with your truest excitement and you don't give in to your lack beliefs and you say this is what resonates, this is what I trust, this is what excites me, I'm choosing this. And day two can lick my ass. Sorry. <laughs> I meant to say kiss my ass. But <laughs> it's it's kind of nasty. <laughs> I do 
can't lick my hand. picture of this caught on and people started saying that instead of kiss my ass. Lick my ass, dude. Okay. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but this puts you instantly in the seat of your power, just to realize there's only one of you. So you can stop blaming everybody else. Because when you blame someone else, what you're doing is you're deferring to your psychology. You're making yourself a snowflake. You're making yourself weak. I'm not saying you shouldn't know and accept yourself. That's different. If you have a trauma and it's acting up and it's flaring up, you have that to deal with. True. Absolutely true. But it doesn't determine who you are. You're not going to sit inside of that bubble and let it define you. Yes, you deal with it. The psychology is there for as long as it's there with the topics and themes that it's there with, and more and more at the topics of your life, you can clean out the psychology altogether until you walk into this particular theme of your life or this particular type of relationship, or, and it's just empty space. Determination inside of empty space. There's just clarity inside of empty space because you've cleared the closet. That's liberating. It's freeing. It's your reward for doing the work, for transmuting the collective, which is yours in the form of the body and the mind. Remember, you're not the body and the mind. You're not the psychology. That's the collectives. You just took it on as a piece of the puzzle to transmute, to thaw out the ice, reaccumulate spiritual mass, and through that free will, transmute it into a beautiful polished diamond that reflects the light of the Creator in brilliant ways instead of in dull, witted ways. Become a powerful, radiant light. Start beaming, but you got to do the work to beam. And you got to realize there's only one of you. And you got to realize you're not your psychology. You got to realize you're not your body and your mind. You're not even your feelings. You determine who you are. Stop giving that away to feelings and thoughts about the feelings, making decisions for you. And excitement is the only exception. Learn to tune into your excitement. It's different than your psychology. It's not your mood that day. The mood is the result of not acting on your excitement consistently. But that's your psychology. It's different than something lighting you up from the inside out, even when you're tired. You can be absolutely tired, super ready to go to bed, and somehow a dialogue begins about something, and it fucking picks up, and it picks up, and boom. You don't even notice you have a body. You're just vibrating. You're on point. You're realigning your whole life. And you can't sleep all night because you're taking notes of what you're going to change. What am I going to eliminate? What am I going to elevate? What am I going to create? Oh, but I thought you were tired. <laughs> See, excitement, passion, clarity, truth, calling... It's of a completely different order than your psychology, your feelings, your moods, your thoughts, your conditioning, your weak-minded decisions. How many of you are there? So who's calling the shots then? Simple. Brings you back to rigorous self-honesty. Yep, that's me. That's me choosing that that's what I am. I'm accepting that I'm my mood because I didn't do what I said I was going to do because I had a mood. So what I'm saying that I am is, I am my mood. Let your word, let your choice define you so that you can, and initially it's uncomfortable, but then as you begin to crawl, and this can happen rapidly, as you begin to crawl out of your psychology, you really realize you get this very strong visceral confirmation that what you are is powerful beyond measure and that free will has nothing to do with psychology. And that your psychology no longer has to determine who you are, what you believe in, what you do, what you say, and so forth. Now you're a creator, a sub-creator, instead of just a human slave. And it doesn't at all have to look like anything I'm doing. It doesn't at all have to look like how I'm expressing that. You don't have to be on stage here shouting. You can bring it into the way that you take care of your children. 
You can never be known by another soul other than your family, and you can still apply this. It doesn't have to look like it looks for me. Important, right? Because we are copy, copy paste beings. It's part of our, the way that we operate and learn. And it's powerful, but it can also be confusing or detrimental or misguiding. So you got to somehow distill the essence of what I'm trying to give back to you. And you've got to, to the best of your ability, apply this to how this uniquely carves itself out for you. So let go of my image, let go of my voice, and just take, okay, what did I actually say? Not that Spintino saying it, what was actually suggested? So, and then take that on for yourself. Create with that from within yourself. Does that make sense? Any other questions? Up front. Yeah, keep your hand raised for the mic runner. Hi. Maybe a very short question, I hope. I was wondering, first it's and second... It's the answers that are the <laughs> problem. The answers, yeah, I mean... <laughs> I was wondering, the first and the second density, can humans be first and second density as well? Or well, then they, they wouldn't be human. What do you mean? If they were second, first or second density, they wouldn't be human. They wouldn't be human. Okay. No. Yeah, that was my question. Mm -hmm. So humans only start as of third density. Do you know like a very, very, very stupid person in your life or something? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> You wonder if they're first or second, yeah. de second density? <laughs> Can humans be second density? <laughs> it comes when I call its name, but that's about it. <laughs> Why the question? What the, what's the root of the curiosity? Well, I, I've heard about the seven density layers from other teachers, let's say, and there that there was a saying like, yeah, humans can also be one first and second. So I just was wondering because when I heard this, I thought, I, hmm, I got to say this, the density system is quite different from a lot of the dimensional systems that are out there. So even though P the number seven repeats itself a lot throughout a lot of teachings, but don't automatically assume they're talking about the same things. So for this, I would only reference the law of one and my own work, I wouldn't reference or automatically assume that others are pointing to the same understandings. Okay. So maybe Thanks. in their understanding, they're accurate and humans can be first or second density, but not according to what this means. Yeah, that's what I wanted to know. Okay, cool. Thank you. <laughs> Sasquatch are second density beings. Uh, any, anyone else here? Yeah. Keep your hand raised for the mic runner. Thank you. Um, um, the seven rays. You were speaking about seven densities this morning. Yes. And um, I'm familiar with the uh, rays from Alice Bailey. Uh, that's different, I think. That's why I wanted some clarification. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Can you uh, can you summarize? the seven rays in like 30 seconds? Yes. So the first ray is about uh, surrender to divine will. So it's about free will, surrender yeah, okay. to Yeah, okay, no, it's, it's a different system. It's a different system. Completely different yeah. system, yeah. Uh, so then um, how can I go deeper? It's by reading the law of one to... By reading the law of one, yes. If you can, if you can handle the language, then, and if you learn to love it, then yes, that'd be the best place to go. Or you can ask me questions. Okay. Yeah. Um, also, there is a gentler version of the law of one, or not so much. It's not directly a version of the law of one, but it's a different being that comes through the same group of people, and they're called Kuo, and they're more digestible. They're a little sappier, they're very still very clear, very loving, very balanced, very useful for humans at this time very useful for wanderers. Um, it's just, it's less technical. It's, for me, slightly less exciting, but it's very practical and very instructive. And, um, and I think this relates or is 
relatable to more people. And it, there, they also talk about the densities quite frequently. But if you just want to know about the densities, then yeah, I would read the law of one. But what's your, what's the nature of your interest in it? Because don't don't just go study something because it sounds like something you might need. Maybe you don't need it. Always question why do I think I need or want that? Unless it's just obvious that it excites you and there's no question about it, right? Then you just do it. You don't have to question that if it's super clear. But if you're like, oh, maybe I should know more about that because then I'll be a more whole person. I'll know more. I'll be better at my spiritual path. Then it's like mental masturbation. It comes out of vanity or a lack belief. Mm -hmm. So then you want to question, okay, what's my actual desire? And what's the most direct route to fulfill that desire? And what's the answer? What's the most direct route to fulfill a desire? To follow your excitement. Follow your excitement. Also a good answer. <laughs> <laughs> yes, a good answer. What else? Nice. Don't create any obstacles. So, another way of saying that, the fastest way to fulfill your desire is to intensify your desire. Purify it. So, if you know what your desire is, let's say it is to have a more complete understanding of myself. What, well, what would you say your desire is? that sparks your interest in the densities. What do you think you're going to get or become by learning more about the seven densities? It's to know more about myself. To know more about yourself? Yeah. Okay, so then you go back to, unless it just super excites you, like, whoa, what did he say? Law of one? Something just stood out to me when he said that. I got to find that book. I just got to read it. Sounds like amazing. I want to read it. Unless it's that clear to you, you might want to question, okay, what's my desire that motivates me to make me think that I want to learn about the seven density? It is to know myself, is what you said? Yes. To know yourself more? Yes. Is that what you said? Yes. Okay, so if I want to know myself more, and I think the way to do that might be to read the Law of One, let me first check in, okay, I want to know myself more. Start without any ideas about that. How could I know myself more? By knowing yourself more. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so then you amplify that desire, that intention, right from where you're at. And instantly, you'll be expanding. And there's new information that comes through, new insight, new perspective, higher vibratory states of feeling, relating. And you're like, fuck. In a split second, I just know myself more. Suddenly, just like that. Don't conjure up the obstacles because you have a meek desire. Intensify, purify what it is that you want and try it directly first. Then if out of that new level of excitement and knowing yourself, you get clear signals to go read the Law of One, go read the Law of One. I still recommend you read the Law of One just in general. Okay? Yes, sir. Perfect. Thank you. All right. Any other question? Or shall we? Yeah? We have to know ourselves better to get a better self esteem. Yeah? Uh, that's not what I said. But okay, what's, what's I, go, your... I go on with the question and then. Yeah. Um, and I would like to know I think that um, we can know ourselves better to meet meet other people sorry to meet other people the first part of the sentence we know ourselves we know ourselves we learn ourselves by by meeting other people okay uh -huh. okay they reflect yeah ourselves yeah and how do we know if it's um, a lesson to learn from them or they are just uh, you mentioned before like Unhair monkeys, unhairy monkeys, something like that. Like we don't have to take hairless monkeys. Like we don't have to take attention to it. How do we know the difference? The difference between being a hairless monkey and what was the first thing? 
the difference between if somebody is here to teach me something, mm -hmm. we met to have a lesson from them, mm -hmm. or somebody is just a hairless monkey and I don't have to take any attention. Oh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> I get your question. <laughs> Sorry, it's a little bit complicated. But. Well, okay. Well, you can always learn from anything. A fool can't learn from the wisest person on earth, and a wise man can learn a whole lot from the most foolish person on earth. So the, how much you learn is absolutely up to how you con constitute yourself, what your attitude is. The wiser you are, the wiser you become faster because wisdom begets greater learning faster so you continue to accelerate right now i process things as, at a speed that i did not eight years ago or five years ago i learn faster more precisely more nuanced now on a day-to-day -day basis than i did five years ago so the learning aspect is entirely up to you whether they are someone that has no relevant feedback for you because they don't understand anything about you or your state of mind or whether they are equals or maybe they are more expanded or more self-aware and they can actually teach you with quite some clarity and direction that is trustworthy uh, but it's pretty obvious isn't it who is who wouldn't you say no, because I think maybe it's just my problem that sometimes um, I got reflection from other people and I always try to learn from it. Even, you know, like always try to understand what they teach me. But sometimes maybe yeah. I... So, but there's a difference between learning from it and taking it seriously. Mm -hmm. First, you got to distill if it's worth learning from. Then if it is, then you take it seriously. But most people take it seriously and then they try to learn from it. Which is how we keep each other small and undermine each other's epic, unique, adventurous, free selves. So by all means listen. Like what's their what's their world like? What are where are they coming from? What's their intention? Not that that matters too much, because you can learn from a bad intention and you can learn from someone with a good intention it doesn't matter to that much but it's worthwhile information for certain choices so where are they coming from and not even so much their intention but what is the state of their knowledge that they come from is this something that I aspire to do I want to end up like them okay I think that's good right mm -hmm. if you want to be more like them in your own way of course but you know you want to be more like they are in a certain field or maybe even overall as a human being then it's worthwhile listening and taking that seriously and trusting that information mm -hmm. if you don't want to become more similar in vibration and ways of thinking and ways of interacting and ways of manifesting than the one who's giving you feedback then just listen but don't take it on stay in your own confidence stay in your own confidence see them as a hairless monkey even if they might have something to teach you just because you might need that initially to stay confident just like picture everyone in the crowd naked because you feel shy public speaking it's just a little tool so just assume that whoever gives you feedback is a hairless monkey okay thanks. and then because then your state of being is like oh cool they have an opinion they have the hairless monkey is saying something <laughs> right and then and then you become sincere but first you gotta at least initially you gotta manage your own confidence level because if you don't it's detrimental and you get swallowed up in the swamp of irrelevant feedback which there is an abundance of so it's absolutely crucial that you don't take just anybody's feedback so first stay in the confidence and then Okay, what is, how does this person think? But leave it with them initially. So, okay, I just want to understand how you think. How do, why do you think that's the best thing to do for me? You, that's your point of view. That's great. I feel great as I am. Why do you, I'm curious. Maybe I can learn something from them. And then if it becomes obvious that you can learn something from it, then it's like, oh, cool. Thank you. And then you add it to yourself. Right? 
Thank you. So, so when you say, and it's not just your problem, most people have this issue, and I used to have it too, which is, as soon as someone reflects something to you, you already take it on. That's not because you believe they're the smartest person in the room. It's belief because you believe you're not good enough. It's because you believe you're not perfect. Because you believe you're fucking up. Because you believe that maybe you're not in integrity. It's because you believe maybe you're not a good person. Because maybe you believe you overstepped society's boundaries and now you're going to get ostracized, judged, rejected, ejected. And you don't want that. <gasps> so as soon as someone gives you a reflection, <gasps> you already fear for your social life. Right? So then it can help to see how ignorant people really are. As a starting point, not to disrespect them, not as a philosophy to then bring out into the world, but just as a tool to help you anchor yourself first and foremost in your own clear seeing, and the trust in your own heart, your own wisdom, so then that you don't automatically take whatever anyone says or reflects seriously, personally. Okay, I just thought I create them to teach something for me. Well, you are, but what they're teaching you now is self-confidence over taking someone's feedback. Okay. So if there's a pattern in what's happening for you, there's a thematic lesson there that spans multiple manifestations and relationships, typically. So here it is, know your own value, know your own wisdom first. That's the lesson. They're not trying to teach you what they are saying. They're trying to tempt you to make you believe that so that consistently you feel down every time you listen to that so that you then learn to not misplace your power that's what they're teaching you not what they're saying thank you yeah at least that's my view take it if you want to become more like this i will All righty. Okay, one very eager person whose desire is very high. Even though we're over time, she's making it happen. Thank you, Bentinho. She was about you. to feel bad when I said that. No, no. judgment. Right, no good. judgment. Um, no judgment. How can we recognize a wanderer either in someone else or potentially ourselves? Uh, most of the people in this room are, is my presumption. There is, I think we're over 600 million at this point. So that's quite a bit. So it's not a rare thing anymore. And you just know. At some level, you just know. You might have doubts about it. I would say over 90% of the cases, if you're wondering if you are, then you are. And you can see by virtue of other things, like are you in new ter are you constantly working in sort of new terrain, new thoughts, pioneering how can we change this? How can we do it? Are you observing society? Are you asking questions? Are you feeling a little bit different than how most people feel? Are you having a difficult time understanding why people interact the way they do? Do you feel a little bit alien? If you feel a little bit alien, some people feel a lot alien, but if you feel a little bit alien, that's typically also an indication. And if you, especially also if you have a strong sense of service to others, it can also be an indicator. Perfect. That's dope. Thank you. Great. <laughs> That's dope. Nice. That's dope. <laughs> yeah. That is dope. 